Step 1. Introduction. Over the years, I've traveled to many places. With the same limited palette, I react not only to the look of a place, but to the feel of the place. The lush, relaxed atmosphere of the south of France, the austere mountains of the French Alps, the otherworldly West Lake in Hangzhou, all have very different energy and evoke different emotions. When I set up to paint in the landscape, my thoughts slow down and eventually stop. My mind becomes blank, like a mirror reflecting the scene before me, but also colored by a emotional response to the surroundings. This response is triggered not only by the place, but also by the journey. Whether I got there by boat, helicopter, horseback, or hiking through the woods with my easel on my back, or simply looking out from my hotel room. All this will have an effect on the paintings. Here is a look at how I got to some of these beautiful places and to the things that happened and the people that I met along the way. Top 2. Vence, France. When I was 26 years old, I quit my job in Boston and decided to dedicate myself exclusively to painting. I only had $400. Given my newly discovered passion for landscape painting outdoors, it seemed like a good idea to be in a warm climate. For the next two years, I traveled around the U.S., often staying at artist colonies. On September 1, 1980, I was invited to stay for three months at the Caroli Foundation in Vence. France. Countess Caroli was the widow of the first president of the Republic of Hungary after the revolution of 1918. They were socialists and began to give all the land back to the people. This was, as you can imagine, very unpopular with the aristocracy and the landowners. After only seven weeks, Michael Caroli was removed from office and exiled from Hungary. After several years on the lecture circuit in the United States, they bought a big property in the south of France with a 200-year-old stone house. When Michael Caroli died, the Countess decided to create a foundation for international artists. She invited writers, painters, sculptors, and musicians from many different countries to spend time in a small cabin she built on a hillside. There were views of both the sea and the mountains. This was where I came to France for three months and where I stayed for 30 years. 3. Vence, France Vence was still very much a village. Life revolved around the cafe. Someone learned that I was leaving the Foundation Caroli and invited me to live in an old chateau at the top of a mountain. The property had a view of the sea from 2,700 feet. The panorama stretched from the Estorelles on the far side of Cannes to the Italian Alps. When my stay in the chateau came to an end, I thought it might be time to go home. Then I met Olivia Pashkov. She invited me to stay in an apartment on the first floor of her house in exchange for watering the garden. It was a pleasure to spend a couple of hours a day under the sun, looking at the flowers. It was supposed to be for a month. I stayed in that house for 20 years. Top 4. Chamonix, France Martine grew up in the French Alps, around Mont Blanc. Her family owned hotels in the region for generations. She now owns a four-star hotel with a two-Michelin-star restaurant. Her son-in-law is the chef. She invited me to paint and settled me into a small chalet. In the beginning, I painted from the large wooden terrace of her house, which overlooked the town and the Alps. The mountains are always changing. I had to paint really fast. The first day, I looked up at the peak called L'Aiguille de Midi. This is famous for having the highest cable car in the world. Then I looked down at my palette. I looked up again and it was gone, hidden in the clouds. Painting here was going to be a challenge. 
Stop five, Hanzhou, China. There's no way to describe Hanzhou either in words or paint without the people. The West Lake is flooded with couples. Lovers from all over China come to stroll slowly along its banks with colored parasols. In Hanzhou, time slows down. Colors fade to a blue-gray mist. There is something magical about this place and amazingly romantic. The lake is lined with weeping willows. Sweeping away from the lake are big meadows with carefully trimmed shrubs and trees. A maze of paths lead to any number of tea houses where one can sit all day with a glass of green tea which is grown on the hillsides west of the town. Hanzhou was the capital of the Song Dynasty from 1107 to 1279. We found a large old tea house set on a big lawn near the lake. The ground floor was always filled with people, but there was a very large terrace upstairs, which was rarely used. They were happy to let me paint there. A very large thermos of hot water came with a glass of Longjing Dragon Well tea, and I was welcome to stay all day. Both the tea and the air were hot and steaming. Stop 6. Tianxian Lake, China This lake is in a suburb of Shanghai about an hour from the city. The neo-Victorian American-style houses in the, the development were mostly weekend homes. It was like a ghost town much of the time. It looked like a scene from an early Tim Burton movie. One of my clients was a developer and offered to let me stay there for the month of May. He gave me a house right on the lake. A long, narrow path between the lake and the marsh led to another world. Tony and his associates had dismantled a number of old houses from other parts of China and rebuilt them to create a historical park. A path led to a 150-year-old wooden bridge. It was about 50 yards long, with decorative paintings on the inside beams. The bridge crossed a river running into the lake and led to a section with about 10 buildings from the Yunnan province, which is in the southwest of China. Large, rustic wooden buildings with thatched roofs were surrounded by wooden totem poles carved from the trunks of trees. Many of them were lying on the ground. Across the road, in another part of the park, there were traditional Chinese houses with lily ponds, flowering gardens, and pagoda bridges. All were authentic, taken apart beam by beam, numbered, and reassembled. They recreated the landscape of an ancient Chinese folktale about tragic lovers. My niece Leora was studying ceramics in Jerusalem. She is the second of my brother's four children. They were all practically strangers to me, having grown up in the U.S. while I live in France. It was a good opportunity to get to know her. One day, the two of us set off for the Dead Sea. We passed the security controls and navigated the chaotic station to find our seats on our bus. The Dead Sea and Masada are among my favorite places in Israel. There are colors and forms unlike any place I have ever seen. The turquoise of the sea, the orange hills of Jordan in the distance, the twisted shapes of the desert rocks. The history there is both tragic and uplifting. It is a place that inspires awe, a place that moves one to silence. It was a good place to begin to know my niece. I had a guide named Bertha, who was from Denmark. She immigrated to Israel a long time ago. She was passionate about her adopted country about its history and its politics. She picked me up every morning at 9 a.m. We toured the north, the west bank, 
we went to Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee and to Haifa. She did her best to share my vision and to find places I would like to paint. We went to Safet, the city of art, and the Kabbalah. The shopwoman there told us about the recent war. She told us about the bombings and about leaving her home, not knowing if it would still be standing when she came back. 